In this video, I'm going to introduce you to something that on our first glance is going to appear to be just a, a little bit of nice notation and a little bit of a nifty trick. And then in the next video is going to seem like a pretty useful tool to demonstrate the equivalence of some things. And then as we go on further in linear algebra, when we look back on it, it's going to appear like one of the deeper and more fundamental ideas. So let me just introduce the notation to you first. I am going to define e sub i. This is going to be a vector. And it is the vector where all of the components are zero, except in the ith location. So for example, if I come down here, I'll have zero, zero, zeros. And then there's a finally a one in the ith location. And then everything else is going to be zeros again. So that one that's, that's the only thing that's non-zero here is going to occur in the ith location component. Now, I can sketch what these particular vectors are going to be, if you can imagine there's going to be n of them if I live in Rn. So, so let's just sketch what E1 and E2 is if I'm going to be in R2. So first up, I'm going to do E1, and I'm going to imagine it's some vector looks something like this, and E1 is the vector 1, 0. So 1 over in the x direction, not up at all in the y direction. And then E2 is the opposite in a sense. It's the vector that's sticking straight up. That's going to be E2. And, and this is the vector that has no x component, but 1 in the y component, at least for the tip of this vector. By the way, we might have called E1 i hat before and E2 j hat before, but if I'm thinking about it in n dimensions, then I'm going to call the EIs, where I could be between 1 and n, my so-called standard basis vectors. So these are the standard basis vectors, and we don't even really know what a basis is yet, so I'm kind of jumping ahead on my nomenclature for you, but that is their name. Now, I want you to imagine that I have a vector. How about this vector over here? I'm just going to make up one. This is the vector x. And in this particular example I've come up with, it looks to be the vector. It looks like it's gone over maybe two to the right and, and up one, something like that. Now, here's the big takeaway. This vector, which is two to the right and up one, can be thought of as going twice in the E1 direction. That's two steps to the, to the right. And then once in the E2 direction. That's our one step up. So in other words, this vector x that we have here can be thought of as twice the E1 plus 1 times the E2. And it's not a coefficient that the, the 2 and the 1 here, the, the coefficients, are the same 2 and the same 1 that I have appearing in the definition of my vector. So, in other words, what we've done is we, we've taken a vector and written it as a linear combination of the so-called standard basis vectors, and in particular, it's the linear combination where you just take the first component is the first scalar and the second component is the second scalar and so on. And then the important and remarkable thing here is that every single vector can be written in this way. It can be written as a linear combination of the standard basis vectors. And indeed, that this works in any number of dimensions. So for example, let me suppose I take a completely arbitrary x. And it's going to have components x1 all the way down to xn. Now, what I'm trying to do is see whether I can write it as a linear combination of these standard basis vectors. But if I look at the standard basis vectors, there's only one that has anything in the first component. It's e1. All the others have a zero in the first component. So if I ever want to hope to, to match up this x1, the only vector that has anything in that first component is going to be the E1, and it only has a 1 there. So what am I saying is, it must be that it has a scalar of x1 in the E1 direction. Likewise, for the second component, the only basis vector that has anything in the second component is the E2, and therefore it has to capture all of the second component. And so all of the x2 is going to be put there, and it's going to be written as x2, e2. And this goes all the way down the line to x, n, e, n. So, in other words, what we have here, this particular linear combination of standard basis vectors, 
is something that I can do for every single vector x. Another thing that I could do is, if I look at this expression that I've got with, this linear combination, we've seen linear combinations before in a different context. In that context, it was that matrix vector multiplication was defined to be the linear combinations of the matrix. So what this is, is going to be a particular linear combination of these vectors. This is the matrix that has its first column is going to be the E1. Its second column is going to be the E2, and that carries along until its nth column is the EN. And then it multiplies to this vector x. So indeed, this linear combination can be thought of as a particular matrix, a matrix whose all of these columns are these standard basis vectors. In other words, it's a matrix with just like a lot of ones down this diagonal and zeros everywhere else. Some very nice matrix multiplied to this vector x. And then finally, we can use this to sort of give a, a different interpretation as to what a vector really is. In this way of thinking about it, a vector is an instruction that tells you what linear combination of the standard basis vectors are you taking. Because every vector can be written in this way, it is telling you which particular linear combination of the standard basis vectors are you talking about. That is one way to think about what a vector is.